Hello, and welcome to the Choralosophy Podcast. This is episode 125, Making the Case for Choir with Tom Metzger. Our jobs as music educators, sadly, must include the ability to persuasively and passionately make the case in our communities that group singing opportunities are crucial. That includes keeping choirs in our churches and in our schools and community organizations. It includes having conversations with local leaders, fundraising, and much more. But what makes or breaks those conversations oftentimes is our ability to make that case airtight, persuasively. Tom Metzger joins me in this episode to brainstorm and think through what happens in society when we have less people singing and how we can explain it to people in more effective ways. How do we warn people that this would be a bad thing if less people were singing and less kids were getting educated on how to sing? And why does it matter? These things seem obvious to us, those of you listening to the show, probably because you've already been sold on that idea. But how do we talk to people who don't understand? Tom draws on his perspective as a computer scientist, yes, that's right, a computer scientist and choral singing enthusiast who works with choral organizations behind the scenes with the business side of choir. Tune in for this conversation and tool up for the advocacy fight, because like I said, sadly, it never ends. Before we get into that conversation, of course, don't forget to use your promo code at sightreadingfactory.com when you get your membership. Every single time you sign up, I want you to throw Choralosophy in that discount code. That helps the show a lot, and it gives you a discount. And you could do the same thing at the other websites that sponsor this show, mymusicfolders.com. You can get a discount when you get all their choir folders. Uh, sheet music at ryanmain.com and graphitepublishing.com. You can throw the, the promo code in there as well. And of course, don't forget to head over to Choralosophy Patreon group, which is patreon.com forward slash Choralosophy, and sign up for $3 a month or more and support financially the costs, the recurring costs of doing the show. It really, really helps a lot. The producers at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Klixpol, Ulrika Igrain, Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. Okay, everybody, I'm here with Tom Metzger. Tom and I are going to be discussing our ideas and our thoughts about the future of the choral music landscape, that being from church to school to community groups to the art of singing together. Uh, wh where do we think it's going? Where has it come from? And this is going to be a fun conversation. So, Tom, welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be on the show. Thank you so much. So, Tom, first, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to my audience? Who are you? Where do you come from? And why are you sitting here on a choir podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm in Vancouver, BC. I've, uh, I was born here, grew up here my whole life. I've been singing since I was a kid. Um, I actually came up through more of the barbershop quartet world, uh, sang in a very good quartet called Real Time. In around 2005, we won the world championship. Um, and I guess uh, besides that, I've also been, uh, my degree is in computer science and around kind of the early 2000s, I was thinking, I was directing a big chorus and I was thinking to myself, this is crazy, there's so much we could automate about this. Uh, and so in 2009, I started a company called Groupanizer, which is, uh, publishes software for running choirs, basically, uh, called Choir Genius. And I've been running that ever since, and I've got, um, we're on like platform version four now, and uh, the best one yet. So, and, and I, of course, because of where I come from, um, singing is really important to me. And uh, I suggested this topic because I'm, I'm concerned about it. I think uh, with, I would say the general decline in, um, in church attendance, uh, and the fact that that's where a lot of people used to learn how to sing, uh, and also with what I perceive to be the deprioritization of um, of singing at the elementary school level, uh, that that's another place people used to learn how to sing, and I'm I'm worried about it uh, um, not being that way anymore, and trying to figure out what could be done to fix that problem. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting, uh, I, and we'll get to all of those things, I'm sure. I'm curious too, though, because of course you said you're. Uh, your degrees in computer computer science, and obviously what you do for a living is computer related, but but to serve choirs and chor choral organizations. So in a lot of ways, it sounds like your story is one of the things that I tell my students in choir class on a regular basis, which is that you don't have to go to to school for music to sing. 
And what oh. the thing the, the things that we are teaching you here are life skills. They there are skills that you can use if you choose to for the rest of your life. And it and because sometimes kids get it in their mind that yeah, you know, uh, I'm not going to focus too much on music because I'm not going to do music for a living. Well, that's not the point. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, I interviewed uh, Morna Edmondson not that long ago. Uh, she's the new president of Coral Canada. Uh, on my own, my own sort of YouTube channel called Choir Success, and uh, she handed me this piece of paper which uh, says benefits of singing, and it's you know physical, psychological, social, emotional, educational. So I feel like a lot of effort and research has been has been done lately about just exactly why is this a good thing to do, and uh, very little of that says because you're going to make a million dollars, right? It's uh, it's more right. about being a human being, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I it's um I think in our culture and I, this is probably I mean of course I'm speaking in the American context you can tell me if this doesn't ring true in Canada but it it seems like the culture is very focused on uh is are the skills that I'm getting in my school curriculum are they directly transferable to something that is marketable that will pay me money. And 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 I think that's that's missing the point in a lot of ways. And because of course, yes, we want our kids to be have marketable skills that they can make a living when they grow up. And of course, but I think that there's a lot of people miss the boat on all those things that you just read off, where those those things actually do translate into marketable skills because those are the people who are happy, those are the people who are productive, those are the people who will stick with their tasks because they feel connected, they feel emotionally fed, they feel present. Uh, these are the people who are in our society are oftentimes the most successful regardless of what career field they're in. And choral singing and group singing and the the connection that it provides helps foster those things. Would you would you say that makes sense? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean. The you can you can imagine going to school for marketable skills uh, like you know learning how to program a computer for example, mm -hmm. uh, but not having the confidence, not having the uh, the sense of yourself. I mean, the ability to to stand in front of people and talk. You, you're just not going to have the same kind of of career that you would have. And I think music and choral singing is one of the one of the best ways to get there. Right to turn yourself into a uh, an interesting person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is one. That is one way, and you also put yourself into, or you turn yourself into a person that um, has to learn how to be vulnerable in real time. And, and I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm going to try to explain what vulnerable in real time means. It's 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 the idea that, like in a choir rehearsal, you have to be vulnerable in real time because you're doing things with other people that could either be right or wrong, and you're doing them right or wrong in front of other people all of the time. And and whereas uh, if you're a, a student in other subjects, say math or or English, where you're writing a paper or something, your your flaws are not on full display for everyone all of, all of the time. Yeah, your successes yeah. your your successes are not on full display to everyone all the time. It, you get a little bit of privacy, but in music ensemble music making, we are uh, constantly it's it's a it's a individual growth pro process, but it's also a group project that everyone can witness. And I I feel like that little insight gets at a lot of what we get out of choral music that is a transferable to all of the other areas of our life later on. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's a real it's a team sport unlike mathematics, right? Yep. Or uh... <laughs> or, or English or creative writing. Uh, those things are all important, but they are not team sports. Uh -huh. yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, I really believe that uh, there's something inherently human about the whole process of singing and that, um, that we, all of us, the whole species uh, does it and have been doing it for thousands and thousands of years, probably since we've been human. Uh, and, and so the importance of it is really hard to overstate. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, you know how many other activities would would meet that description? Um, in, in other words, how, how many other group activities, I should say, um, could could reasonably be claimed to be things that we have done in large groups since the species began? Uh, I know nothing about that except singing and dancing. I think dancing's the yeah. other one. Yeah. Where you, know, uh -huh. you can imagine uh, hunter gatherers around the the fireplace uh, fireplace the fire pit yeah right, right? and they're yep. singing and they're dancing and that's what people do uh, so it's really a shame uh, a lot of the time especially in the last i don't know 100 years i think um, we've been exposed to so many really excellent artists 
in a, in a way that we've never really been exposed to before because of radio and because of TV, because of now the internet. And, and a lot of people's reaction to that is to abdicate their own voice and say, I'm going to leave that to the people who are really good at it. The right? professionals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really a shame. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, that was going to be my next question is just like what um, how how is it that it's possible that uh, that an activity, whether it be singing or dance, um, become is so fundamental to us as humans, but could be cast aside in uh, in a variety of ways through church or school. Let's talk, so let's talk about that a little bit. And I think you did touch on some of it in that uh, there is it's so the recorded medium. Did, I think did play into that, but I think there's more to it in that um, it it could be uh, where you get a little bit of punishment for the, uh, so to speak, punishment for being so prevalent. In other words, there there could be a bias in people's minds that singing is so fundamental that it's it's not going to go away. And mm -hmm. so why why do we need to put it as a school subject that costs you know thousands of dollars to to su support a program you know it, that singing is going to go on whether there's a choir class in a school or not uh so what would be your response to that this that's just me playing devil's advocate yeah sure i think that's a really it's a valuable uh rabbit hole to go down right so mm -hmm. let's say that that there was no training in that would people still sing in the shower and like hum on their way to work probably uh, but that's not quite it, is it? I mean, it's um, there's individual singing, and I think people would do that. Um, I think and, people would still sing maybe, when they're drunk in bars, and you know they would like sure. those things would still happen. Um, and so I guess really what people are getting at pro that that think that way is that what is the value of quote unquote good group singing? Like, why do we need to learn about it in school? so that it it's better because like if if it's a thing that people might do just for fun sitting around while they're you know drinking or playing video games or whatever maybe isn't that enough sure well i mean i think we could find analogies for that all over the place like mm -hmm. just doing something uh by yourself and not caring about the the outcome very much like it's, it's one thing right but to do it in a group and I think there's a number of different kinds of group singing and different kinds of benefits, right? So not every group is all about quality. I mean, I, I love listening to really great groups, but the, the truth is that if you have um, a bunch of people getting together and they're singing for the joy of it, even in unison together, there's a lot of value in that, a lot of that team spirit, a lot of that com camaraderie, and, and uh, you can get, get a lot out of it. But I, I actually think it's – I mean, I'm a person who enjoys doing things well, and I think – there's always benefit in trying to make something better, no matter what it is. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to do it better, trying to do it as well as you can. That interests me, and it always has. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I respond to those types of things. Uh, I try to be as um, as descriptive as I possibly can of the benefits. And so the, here's how I would put it: I would say something like, um, "Well, the reason it matters that kids are being taught formally." how to do these things uh, is because the, they're, they're of the neurological benefits of the psychosocial benefits of the, the, the and, and people criticize this a lot, actually, in music fields is like, no, it, music is just valuable because it's music. But then I usually respond back to say, well, but then you're just playing right into the hands of the people who don't really think it's that important in school, because if it's just music and it's the music happens all over the place, like you said, you can press play on Spotify, music will still be there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. This, but that's so, listening to music. It's it's not the same as as creating yes, music. That's right. the point. Right. And, and yeah, but creating it for for people who haven't done it before, and th those are our kids. That's where you get into the music education aspect of of this. I think where if you've never created music before, you need someone to teach you how to do it. These are not things that just spring out of you naturally. Like yes, there are some kids that are quote unquote better singers. Uh, when they're when they come out of the womb than others, but for the most part, you you have to learn how to do it. And so, if we don't have a formal structure for learning how to do it, then it's difficult to deliver this medium to as many kids as really could benefit from it. Yeah, I I don't believe in the genetic basis of uh, singing talent. Right, the, yeah. the kids who appear to be better out of the womb probably grew up in a family with an awful lot of singing going on. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, my, oh, those, those types of arguments are always interesting to me because it, to me it's very clear that um, with all of those types of things, the answer is both. 
Like there are, there are um, every physical thing that we could do as humans have, has a genetic component, but it also has a um, also has an environmental component. Uh, so it, I've never found a persuasive argument for 100% genetic or 100% persuasive or sorry, 100% environmental. Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I can, I can imagine a genetic component in that because some people will be born with equipment that just lends itself better to, I mean, a bigger range yeah. A nicer tone, right? All of more, that. More so, resonating yeah, sure. space, more resonating yeah. space in the head. Um, mm-hmm. There's all kinds of things. Just like uh, like with athletes, of course. It's uh, to me that's the, that's the analogy. It's it, there with a- some athletes are born genetically to be six nine. You can't be taught to be six nine. Yeah, um, that's very true. Yeah, you know. Um, and so so to me, there's a, but of course, if that six nine person is never taught to play basketball, for example, or they never grown up around basketball, then they're not going to be any better at basketball than anybody else. Right. So they're, no. me, so it's a mixture of, it's a mixture of those things, which I think is, I think is true for singing too. I agree. And you know, I, I, uh, I think I, I barged ahead with an assumption that I probably should check with you because you are a music teacher. Am I right? Yes. That's my day job anyway. Yeah, there you go. So do you find that music, at least in your part of the world, is is being de-emphasized or not? So, the, uh, yes, I was going to get us there uh, regardless, but I'm glad you brought us there. And I appreciate that because I, th- uh, th- well, I have two ways of answering this question because where I am specifically, no, because I'm very fortunate in, to be in a school district that treats music like any other subject in in many ways. Now I could get nitpicky and of course be utopian and and find ways to complain within my school district about things we could do better. But we have a curriculum specialist who advocates for us at our school district level alongside all of the other subject matters and they sit down at you know the table and they we have an equal voice at that table of what do we need to do for music so that music students are getting what they need, et cetera. And not every school district has that. So that, so that's the answer to the question from where I live. But I also, because of this show and the reach that it has to choir directors, music teachers, performers, et cetera, all over the world, I'm also keenly aware from conversations that, that this has allowed me to have where I understand how out of the normal my situation is. Right. Um, if that makes sense. And whereas I, before I started doing this show, I knew that we had it, we had it good where I am, but I, now I'm more aware of some of the things that my colleagues deal with. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the, we used to wonder, um, in the barbershop world about, cause the, the barbershop world has probably shrunk by half since the mid eighties. Mm-hmm. And of course a lot of hand wringing about that. Um, but then we point out that, well, basically all membership organizations have, have dropped in in the same way. Service clubs, bowling, I mean, all kinds of things. And and it's the it's the decline of the middle class to me that makes the biggest difference. Like, do people have the spare money and time to, to uh, go out and do what's kind of an expensive hobby? And I'm talking about barbershop in particular being expensive because of all, all the potential travel and, and et cetera. But... Mm-hmm. Um, we can't ignore that, and I think that has a real, uh, has a huge impact on on the school system because when when push comes to shove and the people say, okay, what are we going to focus on? And I think they make the mistake of going, the only important thing we need to do is to make sure that these kids can get high paying jobs, right? Right. Uh, and not that that's not important, but back to the beginning of the conversation, I I don't think it's the only important thing, and I think they missed the boat because. Um, being graduating from choral singing and having that in your repertoire, so to speak, um, makes you a better employee as well to go along with your other skills. So yeah. it's really short sighted. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, of course, one of the best ways that we could get the people who are in those decision making positions to understand that is for them to have experienced it. That's the that's that's the chicken before the egg problem. Uh, where we, like we can't, we have to get people into positions of power and decision making capacity who who can understand whether it's whether it's somebody who played in their band who can understand what choir would be like even if they never sang choir, but uh, or they played an orchestra or or because to me this these types of conversations are bigger than just choir. They like there's uh, there is something special about ensemble music making that a lot of these things uh, kind of run across all of those areas. 
Um, you know, and and so I'm interested in kind of taking the taking this conversation in that direction where uh, we kind of hypothesize just a little bit back and forth about why some of these places that that maybe aren't as fortunate as where I am, uh, what, where where does this this idea come from that they don't need to sing or that they don't need to sing well, as we've kind of been talking about that? And then how do we how do we solve that problem? What are what are your thoughts? Like, do you have a dream? Do you have a a strategy? Mm-hmm. Oh well, I mean, if we were kind of dipping into what would one do about this, right? Mm-hmm. How would you how would you use influence to to move the world in the in the direction that you think is right? And uh, yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. I mean, you, you remind me a little bit of, um, of the, it's lobbying in a way, right? It's uh, mm-hmm. how do you get people in positions of power? Uh, and there's there's certainly um, just being careful choosing my words here, but the there's aspects of the American culture who have spent a lot of time getting people into power to to move their own agenda. That's probably not a not a shock. Mm-hmm. And, and I asked this question too up up here in Canada of some people who know the situation here. Um, it, are there people lobbying for for choral music in Canada? Uh, apparently, yes, there are. Uh, but the the opinion was in that interview, but they could be doing a lot better uh, in terms of of uh, making their points and and getting things actually done. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, is there so that's actually interesting because I, I'm not really too familiar with. Um, how that works in Canada. So I know that there is a Canadian choral uh, organization similar to how we have in the United States and in, in Great Britain, there's the ABC organization. They have that as well. Um, is is that your main go-to in Canada for any type of advocacy at the political level uh, Is with, through, through this organization, would you say? Yeah, I have to confess, I don't know. I know Choral Canada is not a big organization. And we, we have a situation where... Uh, there's a choral federation sort of, right? So every province in Canada has their own choral federation and they kind of have a relationship with the national body, but all the choirs and choruses belong to the provincial groups and then there's a little bit of kind of revenue transfer. And then there's, I I think they probably are the overall advocacy. Uh, But much like in the States, there's, uh, uh, you guys have NAFME and I'm sure there's a, there's a, 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 a group like that up in Canada where the music teachers all uh, belong. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I, I will say that, that education is a provincial concern in Canada. So whether there's a federal one, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. And that's the same in the United States. Uh, our, our education systems are very much run by our states. Um, and, uh, and so that it is a similar situation, although the American Choral Directors Association is uh, probably more formally attached to the state chapters. In other words, we all are, we have state chapters of the American Choral Directors Association. So uh, we don't, we're not loosely affiliated. It's very affiliated, if that makes sense. Uh, So we have to pay, uh, our state chapters have to pay dues to the national chapter to be, or to the national organization to be members, which I think there's advantages to that because our organization is huge. You know, there's 20 something thousand members. Um, But that, that even then, um, it that doesn't really provide you a lot of political power in the U.S. So the uh, the way I would put it, if for at least so kind of to answer my own question in my dream world, I think these types of things have to be uh, differences have to be made at the local level for for us to be to make an impact. So let me get kind of share my story. And I don't know that my audience has heard me really pontificate much on this. So I appreciate you, you, you bringing this topic because the way I think about this is that choral music is important in my community, partly because we have teachers in this community who are embedded in the community. They are essential to the community. They are present, visible, and indispensable in the community. And they know everybody. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so when when we advocate for our programs, people listen because like myself and some of my other teacher friends from this community, we grew up here. Our parents grew up here. Um, We have made ourselves, uh, you know, it's not a tooting my own horn thing, but we've made ourselves pillars of the community so that when we talk about how important choral music is in the lives of our students in our community, people actually listen. And I think uh, th- that's hard because that takes years and years and years of investment. 
um, to, to get yeah. to that point. But I, I to, I've never really seen a better model than that. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think you're you're right when the when you say that the the local level is where this kind of thing is going to happen. Yeah, and then then you have to have a conversation about money, right? So right. that not that it's the most expensive thing in the world to make choral music happen. It does not like you need a whole lot of equipment or yeah, you know, a football stadium or anything like right, that's one of that. our best selling points. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, but for what money is required, uh, there's this question of how much is going to come from, say, the government, right? The when that could be the state or the local or the city or whatever, mm -hmm. and how much is going to come from just individuals, right? Uh, and in that sense, I think it parallels what what every uh, choral organization winds up doing when they when they have financial needs is that they have this mix of, of incomes from from different areas. Um, yeah. But, well, you know, but that's where anybody uh, like using the or raising money to lobby to kind of uh, change things for the better in this regard. Although, yeah. No, it's funny that you bring that up because that's actually in. you're right. It's one of our big, biggest selling points in a sense in that it, we can we can get a program going for a lot less money than, say, for example, a band or an orchestra. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. we can do we can get one up and going a lot easier. But in my experience, that's also been one of the, the the biggest barriers to fundraising, because people, if they're not invested in our world, if they don't understand what we understand, then they see, well, how much money could it possibly cost? Why do you need this money? It, you just you're standing there and singing, like that that, that should shouldn't that be free? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, well, and, I mean, and the, the, yeah. Go ahead. How would leadership's you? Leadership's not free, and the the music's not free, and and you're right. It's a it's a lesser amount of money, um, and and to me, like that sounds like a good a good investment. Imagine I was a philanthropist, um, which I only am to a very very small degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd rather get the bigger bang for my buck, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, I, and I'm I would never say anything bad about uh, high school music. Uh, like uh, the or orchestra and band programs, because I think they're wonderful. And I did that as well when I was in high school. Um, but I mean, if you've only got X dollars and, and uh, you can spend it on a choir, isn't that the best? The, isn't that the most uh, leverage you can get in this regard? Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, that's off, actually very close to the argument that I then make when I'm in that situation is, is value. So mm -hmm. like you are getting a lot for your donation because we can stretch it really far. Um, but, and, and so what I try to do is I try to, every time I have a conversation about money with somebody, I'm always ready for, to list out uh, the expenses that most people would never think about yeah, for, yeah. for running a choir. Um, and, 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 and then oftentimes it's, it's, oh, wow, you, you spend how much on sheet music every year? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's for my program at the school, it's thousands and thousands of dollars right. just just to get the sheet music. And most people just like you, it seems obvious to us because we we sing in choirs and we have our whole lives. But you t talk to somebody who maybe is writing the check and they are they are not choir people, mm -hmm. but maybe maybe their grandkid is or whatever, and so they're willing to to talk to you about fundraising. Uh, but they don't understand it, right? So this is my world. This is the like when when I talk to people, it's often people that they've got checkbooks, they've got money, but they've never really experienced it. So then I have to explain, like in right. in, in painstaking detail. And oftentimes when I get to the sheet music cost, they're like, "What? It costs <laughs> that much?" I'm like, yeah. Well, I mean, those composers want to be paid, do they not? Right. Or at least J.W. Pepper wants to be paid. Yeah, you know, in, in in my experience, it's never it's never that they that they seem like it's not fair that it costs that much. They just never think about it. it it's never it's just never crosses their mind that it would cost that much. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, there's a, a bit of a tangent, but I think the difference between uh, the the people who go uh, the, the experience of being in a choir and being in a band is around that vulnerability you were talking about earlier. Because if I'm a mm. bass guitar player or a, or a saxophone player or a drummer. To me, that's uh, that's one kind of vulnerability. I mean, I'm out there showing people whether I can do the, my thing well or not, but it's not my own personal voice and instrument that's on display, right? Yeah. It's uh, yeah. you know, it's the instrument that I'm using. So it's just that much more immediate and that much more 
vulnerable. Anyway, I know that's just a tip. Yeah, no, I I agree. I've I've made that observation before too, and I because I, I played in band as a kid too, and I it's a totally different um, emotional reaction. If your band teacher tells you you're out of tune and you're a wind player, you yeah. just you just like oh I'm going to wet my reed down a little bit. I'm going to twist my ligature and I'm going to blow a little bit harder. No no harm no foul. Mm-hmm, but if mm-hmm. you can tell a singer they're out of tune, it's like <gasps> clutches. Yeah. Pearl, you know, yeah. Nobody to blame but your own ear. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, well, let's talk about church a little bit because sure. you you brought that up at the beginning too as one of these kind of pieces of the puzzle to this whole thing that this this cultural de-emphasis, as you said, of of choral singing, group singing. What is it that you see in the church world? that concerns you, whether it be from where you are in Canada or just more broadly? Yeah. I, I mean, um, I, I think everybody's experience is probably a little bit different. But for example, the the church that my parents belong to uh, has been shrinking and shrinking and getting older and older. Mm-hmm. And they now have a very small choir. And it's kind of, it's mostly people in their 60s and up. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and... and uh, it used to be the case that in our culture, almost everybody went to church every Sunday. It's just the way it was, right? Went to a Christian right. church every Sunday, uh, and that and that had this uh, this benefit of of everybody was singing hymns, um, you know, and and, and you you just grow up, and every week you've got this you've got this book in front of you with these notes, and you're trying to figure out what they mean, and at least, at least I did. Um, you know, I sat down and, and tried to follow that. And really, that's probably how I learned how to read music. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, and and the, the the numbers say that at least in most jurisdictions in North America and in Europe, the, the number of people who regularly attend church is dropping and has been dropping for decades. Uh, and so and, and I'm, I'm not going to pass judgment about about that as a specifically because I think it's a whole separate issue. But um but basically, those people, uh, the, the number of people learning how to sing and how to and to love singing, is going to be smaller just because of that cultural trend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, in a lot of ways, what I see in church is kind of ties back to what you were saying earlier with the recorded music problem of oh, I'll just let ah, other people, mm-hmm. I'll just let other right. people sing because in a lot of ways that's a parallel there to the praise band phenomenon. In churches, they are right, is, which is not the same, right? It's like you, they, it's a rock band, kind of, right? But and, yeah, it involves less people, mm-hmm. and so, the expectation yeah. is not a sing along, right? It's yeah. not that it, it's not participatory in the same way that I, the, where I grew up in yep. church, there's really there's, there's an organ, yes, but the whole point is that everybody is singing together, and uh, I'm aware a lot of the um, the sort of um, Eastern European tradition or Orthodox tradition over there, where you're not even allowed to have instruments. Like it's literally a cappella. That is the only mm-hmm. thing that is permitted. Yeah. Nor can yeah. you sit down in many of them. But yeah, a yeah. separate issue. Right. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. No, I think time, that's. I think the question is, where do the singers come from? If the schools, um, broadly speaking, are declining, and the and so are the churches. Right. Mm-hmm. What What do we do about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's uh, for for me, it's the, the praise band thing is significant because in the church. So because we again, we have to kind of keep all of these things separate. We have to be careful, I think, of of just averaging everybody out into one big problem, because like you said, it depends on where you are and depends on yeah. what kind of church you go to. There are some types of churches that are that are growing. And often but right. oftentimes they are the types of churches that are the praise and worship modern rock band type churches. Mm-hmm. And that's fine if they're getting like the theological, spiritual, I guess, food that they need. I don't want to pass judgment on that. But the but the reality for this conversation is that those are, so let's say the church is growing, but the percentage of people who are actually participating in the music making at those churches is then shrinking because that rock band is not going to grow. It's going to have its five people or whatever and if whether that's a 500 person congregation or it grows to mm-hmm. 5000 it's still going to be five people making that music i see that as a problem like because that's that is that just de-emphasizes the participatory nature of of worship music yeah yeah absolutely mm-hmm. absolutely right and i think maybe the uh, where we wind up i think and of course i deal with 
uh, a lot of choral organizations in my day day to day life. And, and I think their challenge just becomes different. I think that what they, but it's also an opportunity uh, because the, um, there's an inherent appeal to people in, in knowing how to sing. And they have a, I feel like most people have a desire or at least an interest in, in doing it. Uh, many of them, of course, have been told that they can't do it, shouldn't do it. You have a terrible voice, you know, all of that stuff. And that's, again, a whole separate issue. But yeah. um, since training is going to be required at a, at a higher level, um, I think there's a, there's a pattern of organization that, that could do really well, where it's like a funnel in a way where you start with a large group of people and the idea is we're gonna learn how to sing together, right? With no expectations, no audition, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna figure it all out together. And then it funnels into, uh, as they can handle more complexity and more interesting music that way, and as they grow in confidence, they can move into what we would recognize as being higher level ensembles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's crucial. And, and what I'm interested too, it, it just kind of all of all these topics that we've kind of gone around, it's, it's this idea of um, how do we explain all of this to people who don't already get it, you know, yeah. because they're in, and this is in a lot of ways, this is my, um, kind of underlying submission of doing this show is that, that, you know, I have a decent amount of people who listen who are not immersed in our world and they mm -hmm. listen because they listen because they're starting to understand the advocacy aspect of like, well, this is, well, these are, these are topics and that we inter intersect with, so to speak in a choir are the same topics that society intersects with. Right. Like, we, we are we, the choral music world. This is how I, I explain it to people is that the choral music, experience is a microcosm for society at large we are we are like a test tube <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or a, no that's the wrong word a petri dish uh, a choir is a <laughs> petri dish uh for for measuring how society might react in certain situations because we're so like t typically a choir group is is diverse in terms of political beliefs they're uh, they're diverse in terms of religious beliefs and of course unless of course it's a church choir um but you know there's the, there's all of these different parts of the community come together um and so to me I, I like to think about how do you explain it to somebody who has never done it and those are the types of things that I come up with of how do I make the make this analogy to to make it seem valuable to somebody who's never experienced it uh what what are your thoughts about yeah that? well I I, I think the one of the, one of the things I know is effective is getting them to experience it. Um, yeah, of course, yeah. right. Uh, and and one of the I, I wish there was I wish this happened more in in sort of the choral world. But one thing that happens at barbershop conventions all the time is tag singing, where you take like the last bit of a song and mm. you teach it by rote to pe mm -hmm. people. And every everybody in that whole community knows a bunch of tags that are simple enough. That you could give that give it to a person who has literally never sung before, and they'll be successful doing it because they have three other singers or more, I guess, who uh, who can who can handle it. And you give them a part that doesn't move or something, right? Or a very very simple part. Uh, and and that's been a that's been a really good thing for people. Like, oh, uh, here, come and come and sing this thing, uh, and then and then they can make it happen, and then they get the the. Uh, that feeling you can't get anywhere else where you have this sound of your own voice making music, maybe for the first time ever, right, with other people. Uh, so, so that's kind of my short answer is, um, is they need to experience this and, and, then, and then it'll be much easier yeah. to make your case. In a non-threatening way. Like they have, yeah. to experience it. they have to experience it in a way that they don't feel intimidated about what they're about to try. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I have my uh, so right now I, I was talking about how my situation at my school is is really good and it is. But one of the downside, one of the challenges that I'm about to really face in my job is that for the very first time in the 20 years that I've worked in my district, um, eighth graders, I start I start teaching kids when they get to ninth grade. Okay, eighth, eighth graders have always had to either choose between art and music in our district, which meant uh -huh. which meant that I was essentially getting to recruit from like half the student body. Mm -hmm. Like, so that's a lot of kids in my district. It's a big school. Um, as of, as of this year, they no longer have to choose between those two. They can get through eighth grade without choosing art or music. Oh, and so our, so, so our numbers are going to go 
way down unless I do something. Okay. So my, uh, my plan for next year, and I've not talked to him about this yet, but I'm pretty sure the head football coach at my school does not listen to my show. So I'm going to reveal my plan. I am going to try to convince him to let me come the week before school starts and teach the football team to sing the national anthem. Ah, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's creating the experience that people need to have. Yeah. And And also, I guess, you're you're probably doing a correct read of the social situation in your school, and and yeah. if the if the football team can can be singing, then I imagine a lot of people will view it differently. Yep, yep. Because I'm not having any trouble getting girls to sing. We we've always been fortunate to have like a, a lot of boys, but also a lot of girls. And it's and and with this change in it, it makes sense if you if you're in eighth, seventh, or eighth grade in puberty. Yeah, and you get to choose. You don't have to choose choir you're not you're you're a lot less likely if you're a boy because the voice change is so traumatic um i, I remember yeah yeah and so uh so right now what we've seen our our girls numbers didn't drop off all that much but the boys went like almost in half right and, yeah. uh, and so you know so that's going to be where i go i'm not going to go to the girls volleyball team because that's not the problem i'm going to go to the football team <laughs> see if i can get them so yeah it's an interesting phenomenon but that's that, i think that's exactly your your insight is exactly right is they have to experience it there's not really a substitute for that yeah yeah that's yeah. exactly right and, yeah and i think and i tend to gravitate towards i'm going to say kind of free market um solutions to these problems where you know, one of my other goals is to show a bunch of people how they could actually make money uh, running a running a choir, a community choir or a choral organization of some kind. Because I think uh, the people who have ambition to make money would much more likely go into something else, right? And yeah. they think of they think of what we do in choral music as being not a good way uh, and not a possible way, perhaps, to do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to show them models where it does work. And I, I'm, I've been thinking about it a long time and I have this book in mind that would kind of lay all that out. Cause again, I run into a lot of, a lot of different organizations every day. Um, uh, not that I've, I haven't even broken ground on that project yet, but, but this is kind of why I see it the same way with, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I lost my connection there. No, uh, okay. It was about to, uh, what the solution is to um, to getting people interested in uh, in choir, right? And um, is if you bring bring more of the more of their entrepreneurial interests into it as well. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and, um, and getting people to be able to experience it in that way. Yeah. Uh, and and how you know anybody trying to build an organization like the one I was describing with the sort of broad based funnel of people who were previously non singers. Um, if they're going to be entrepreneurial and make that happen, then they're going to have to do a lot of getting people comfortable and, and giving people a safe way to start and to try and to enjoy. Yeah. Now, uh, since you brought that up, so I'm, I, I was one of the questions I was going to ask you anyway, is that is just uh, you since you have all have these client choirs that that work that work with you through your software or is software mm-hmm. the right word? Web, 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 bla- uh, web based platform. Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, software sort of connotes the packaged things that you right. can buy off of. The, but to me, yeah. it's all it's all software, right? It's, it's all just, software. You know, okay. It's so cloud-based so, software. Right, right. So in your experience working with your clients, are they seeing or do you hear about or 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 see evidence of this decline problem that we're talking about that uh, where uh, people are are kind of panicking or is this just something that you're hmm. You know, where's a really it? interesting question. Uh, I remember when COVID started, uh, and I was thinking to myself, what is going to happen here? Like, are, are there going to be a lot of choirs who just kind of fold, go out of business? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I was very surprised because the numbers, at least in my sample size, which is, you know, several hundred groups, uh, were just about one or two percent above the background rate of choirs folding anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. it didn't seem to make all that much difference. Uh, and I and now in the post COVID world, I'm seeing a lot of new groups and a lot of very revitalized groups, uh, and I think people are getting are getting smarter about uh, changing their model and updating their model. The, the one great thing about our society is it's very competitive and entrepreneurial in some ways, and so uh, a, a better idea can very often uh, outcompete a worse idea. So it's mm-hmm. kind of incumbent upon every business, and I would say every choir is a business as well. 
to continually reevaluate their model and make sure they're doing things the, the best way. And a lot of people are doing that. Unfortunately, the ones who don't do it are in decline. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, makes so, sense. Because, and you can't even just stick with the people that you already have because everybody ages and, and eventually either you wind up with a group that is so old that they can't attract young people anymore. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so you, you really have to be careful and play your cards right, I think, to make it work. But the good news is that a lot of people are doing a good job of building their organizations. Um, and particularly the ones that I see are the largest ones, uh, the, the children's choirs that have, you know, nine different ensembles and you age up and, and all of this stuff. Right. It's not just them. Really, really everybody. They seem to be doing pretty well. Um, I, I just, I, my concern is mostly it keeps changing and I think it will keep getting harder as the, as the middle class declines and as the pool of pre-trained singers is smaller, right? So I see this being a problem in, the, in a five or 10 years. And uh, right now people are actually coping quite well with the change in the environment, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the, I think I put this in the category and as we kind of uh, wrap this up, this could be kind of like our, our way to put a bow on this is that, you know, like a lot of problems in a society, you can point to what would happen if nothing changes. In other words, like if we don't do X, Y, Z, then I can see that this will decline to be the demise of the coral world or whatever. Like if you want to get mm -hmm. ap apocalyptic about it, um, or you could say this could happen, but here's how I'm going to do X, Y, Z to try to prevent that, uh, to try mm -hmm. to stem the tide. And I think uh, it sounds like that's the, obviously the spirit of this conversation is to to say like, we there are, yes, there are things we should watch out for and try to be careful about, but there are some really important things that we can do uh, along the way. And that's kind of how I think yeah. about this. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not here to promote my software at all, but my whole, the whole point of it is to make it easier to run a choir with fewer people and, and yeah. fewer resources because to just to make things more efficient, right. Uh, that, that is the whole value of, of having a system that knows how to, how to run a choir. Right. Yeah. Now on the way out though, of course, I do want you to tell people where they can go and find information about your, your, your software, because it, it uh, any tool uh, that's people would always ask when they're listening to this show is what tools can I take away? What, what ideas can I go look at? So where do we find, right. uh, where do we find uh, your stuff? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. That's easy. There's a website, choirgenius.com. You can go there and see all the different offerings that we have. Uh, we integrate with a couple of apps, including one called Playback Genius and one, and very soon one called Chorus Class as well, which is out of, uh, out of Europe. Um, also, I'd love for people to, uh, I, I started uh, in, order, in the spirit of giving back, I started my own uh, podcast or YouTube channel called Choir Success where I've been interviewing people who uh, are smarter than me and know, know uh, how to make things work, uh, both at an artistic and at a business level for choral ensembles. Uh, when we dropped the very first one last week, and that was Kari Turunen from the Vancouver Chamber Choir up here in Vancouver. Uh -huh. uh, and then Kirsten Oberoi will be up this week. And I know I'm excited about that. She's excited about it as well. So... If people want to look up Choir Success on YouTube and subscribe, uh, I'd be very, very happy to have them on the on the list. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great. And welcome to the choir podcasting broadcasting community. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's going to be it's not a huge community, but I'm happy to be in it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've been uh, this show has been around since February of 2019. And um, when when I started this show, there was one other, like ever anywhere in the world, and yeah. uh, and now of course there's dozens, and um, and so it is a I'm very much a believer in the uh, the 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 idea that the pie is not a fixed size; the pie can grow. Um, and the more I I do this show and engage with people like you, because I think the more people who are talking about choir. The, the better that is for all of us. Um, you know, we, we feed on the idea that making choral music uh, is a prevalent and visible part of our, our culture 
it benefits everyone who participates in this for a living or for fun. So this is a, yep. this is very good. I think make, making the conversation uh, more vibrant uh, by having more people talking about it would be good for everybody. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for joining me. This is a, a fun chat. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all, as always, for sticking around to the end of an episode. I appreciate you. Those of you who are still listening to the end, that probably means you are the person who is a real philosopher. And so that means if you're still listening and not on the Patreon, head over there. We need you. Patreon.com forward slash philosophy, And also be a discount code warrior every time you use your school budget to purchase sheet music. Try to grab something from RyanMain.com or GraphitePublishing.com and your Sight Reading Factory memberships. Use those promo codes there. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.